Now the final two are the market value ratios. And they are again directly um, or directed rather at the equity holders of the firm. Uh, and the first one is called earnings per share or EPS. And again, this is a really common thing that gets reported, gets talked about, is a very common measure. It is sort of specifically aimed at uh, shareholders and it is because it's net income divided by the shares outstanding. So this is the firm's profit divided by the number of ownership shares that exist. That's what shares outstanding means. So again, one of the reasons why return on equity is so important to shareholders is because they get, they expect, they are promised a piece of the profit. And earnings per share tells them what the maximum piece of the profit they could expect. In other words, if the firm were to distribute all of its profit as dividends, then the shareholders of the firm would receive that as an earnings per share. So net income divided by shares outstanding can be uh, any number. There, there isn't, a, there isn't a, a boundary on that. I mean, depending on the number of shares and the net income, it could be you know, as high as you know, 100 and as low as a cent. Um, and uh, all that matters is depends on how many shares there are and what the net income is. If there's only one share outstanding, uh, then uh, it, you know, the, then the net income is a million, then earnings per share is a million. Right? And remember that shareholders don't expect to actually receive the earnings per share. They don't expect to get, if the earnings per share is say, a dollar per share, they don't expect to receive a dollar per share because that would imply that the firm is paying out all of its profit as dividends and it would imply that that means the firm doesn't think it needs to save any of its profit to reinvest as retained earnings. But it is an indicator of the maximum amount that they could receive. And in general, shareholders are hoping that if managers are behaving correctly, this number is creeping up over time. That over time, the firm is improving its profit, is providing more value to shareholders, is maximizing shareholder value. And then the last one is something called the P.E. ratio or the price to earnings ratio. And this is something different than all of the other ratios that we talked about. And it's something that's more relevant for the rest of this class, maybe, than, than the previous ones. The price to earnings ratio is the price per share divided by the earnings per share. So for instance, we might have earnings per share of a dollar. That means if shareholders got all of the profit as a dividend, they would each get a dollar. Right? The price per share then might be $100 per share. This is what you would have to pay in order to buy a stake in the firm. You would have to buy 100. I mean, you would have to pay $100 to buy one share. And then if you received your total earnings per share as a dividend every year, you would receive a dollar per year. Right? So if the PE ratio is high, this is telling us something about shareholders' expectations of the future. Because why would you pay $100 for something that will only pay you a dollar per year? You would have to hold it for 100 years. You would have to own that share for 100 years to receive the dividends, enough dividends to pay you back. And none of us are going to live that long. Well, probably. But most likely, we're not going to live that long. So we're not going to live long enough to recollect it then why would we pay that much? For instance, like Apple shares are $400, Amazon shares are like $1,800. Amazon doesn't even pay dividends. So why are people willing to pay such a high price for something that, that, that doesn't provide them that much value in terms of dividends, in, in terms of your profit share? Well, what it means, the only reason you would be willing to do that is because what you expect is twofold. One, that dividends are gonna go up because profit is going up, because managers are creating more value because they are maximizing shareholder value. And two, you're expecting that because of all that, the price that you paid, uh, the price of the share also climbs as expectations continue to increase about how fir the firm continues to perform. So this is something really different. It's not telling us about efficiency. It's not telling us about how the firm is generating money or profit controlling its cost structure, it's telling us about what investors, people outside the firm, expect the firm to do in the future, how they expect the firm to behave and perform in the future. And that can be almost as valuable because the more people we have paying attention to a firm 
and then the more expectations that we can collect, uh, then the more people we have that might catch something that we missed. In other words, I might value a firm, look through all the information, come up with an idea about what I think the firm's gonna do, but if a hundred other people do it and then we all compare notes, we're likely to find things that we're gonna miss. So the PE ratio is a collective expectation about firm performance and behavior in the future, and it can be very useful. Okay, uh, that's all the ratios I have. So again, these aren't gonna be in the slides. Uh, I mean, they're obviously they're in the slides. They're not gonna be in the, uh, uh, the formula sheet. Uh, you're not gonna have a homework over them. Uh, they're relatively straightforward to, uh, to just remember, uh, and you will see them on the exam, so make sure that you, uh, before the exam, that you come back in and you look through these and, and, uh, and, and commit them to memory. Now, there are some issues with using ratios. There's lots. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a few uh, to, uh, to wrap this uh, lecture up. Uh, the first one is that, there, the, I guess the biggest thing is that because what we use ratios for is uh, their ability to aid us in comparing different firms or the same firm across times, uh, we have to be conscious of the fact that comparability is not always the right thing to do uh, or is not always possible. For instance, I already mentioned that we don't necessarily want to compare uh, the Angry Birds firm to uh, a car firm or to Boeing. They're just not similar enough uh, to, to make any comparison worthwhile. Uh, and, and that goes for other different distinctions. For instance, if we're comparing uh, a firm that has global operations versus a firm that only operates in their domestic country, uh, we're gonna have issues with comparability as well because the global firm is gonna report income and use different accounting rules sometimes. Uh, so for instance, Toyota compared to Ford, well, Toyota is listed in the Japanese markets. It follows Japanese accounting rules. Those aren't always the same. Some of these differences can cause ratios to be different between the two different firms. And so, uh, uh, so the, uh, the reporting issues, the accounting stuff can cause differences. Likewise, if we have a diversified firm, we have an issue where diversification means that uh, a diversified firm is one that operates in lots of different business sectors. So a diversified firm uh, is like uh, General Electric or, or um, yeah, General Electric, they're the best one. They operate in like 100 different industries. So they make uh, nuclear submarine engines, they make wind turbines, they make MRI machines, they also make light bulbs and washing machines and microwaves, right? So they sell all different kinds of things. And we have to be careful that we don't compare a firm like that. Even though GE does make microwaves, we can't compare GE to a firm that only makes microwaves. Their ratio is going to be totally different. Some of GE's other businesses are going to overlap and spill into their microwave business because they're a collective firm. Right? So we have to be careful that we don't compare heavily diversified firms that do lots of different things to firms that only do one specific thing. And then second, we have to be aware that accounting principles mean that, uh, and especially differences in accounting principles mean that uh, we, we need to be aware that firms uh, with different sets of accounting principles uh, can't always be compared to each other. Okay, that's all we have for this chapter. Uh, we will, again, it's short, no homework for here. Uh, you will have to remember all the ratios for the exams, and we'll pick back up with chapter five and six and the time value of money next week.